All right, so I've got one of the coolest games that I've actually had in quite a long while. Uh, if you want to see that in particular, just skip all the way to the end. But otherwise, we're going to see what uh, led up to that point. In this game, I am playing more of that hybrid Dagon. I've been really, really enjoying it. Uh, it seems like a... If I were to compare it directly to anything else, it almost reminds me of like spying Nilfgaard because it has a lot of uh, power while also retaining some flexibility. It's a really fun deck, even though I didn't really like it at first. And even still today, it seems like really weird how well this deck works because you're using like Vran Warriors and Eggs and Neckers, and yet you're not playing a Consume deck. Not really. You have Consume Synergy, but you're not playing Unseen Elder and you're not playing... Uh, Stuff like ghouls or uh, fiends and stuff like that. But still, it's a, it's really fun. It's a lot of fun. While also still packing some power and also has really tricky things like carryover, which can be difficult for people to deal with if they're not familiar with um, the way to counter it. And like over the past couple of days, I've actually been playing some ranked when I usually do not. Uh, and I'm like <laughs> going like 20, 20 games and I'll lose like two of them. It's good, it's good stuff. Uh, so far up to this point, um, I use my my ED lad to get rid of his his uh, spy shooter dude. I don't know. I don't even know what's called. Funnily enough, never used that card when I was playing doing my bout with uh, playing spies. Surprisingly, he plays out his spy, which I think was unnecessary when he has a uh, biting frost. I think he should have tried to play out that round a little bit more, but he gives it up to me. I go one card down. That's that's completely fine by me. And in this round, I'm basically just trying to bleed him out as much as possible. Really unfortunate that I draw I drew both of those harpies. That's I'm pretty sure it's a part of the mulligan bug. Uh because I mulligan two of them um in the first round. Although it could just be chance, but it's not a big deal. That's kind of like probably my biggest knock against this deck is that even even though I did take out Roach from the original Deck list, your draws can really be messed over, especially if you don't play certain things uh, quickly enough. Like if you don't play Woodland Spirit in round one, uh, which is a really good way to get Foglet and Harpies out of your deck, then you're basically stuck with the Foglet and Harpy in your deck, right? So right here, I'm just trying to bleed them out as much as possible, I believe. I think that's what I go... Although I do have a Miracle Test Storm and a Igni, so it's not really necessary for me to go too far into this round. But I do have cards like Ekamara, although Ekamara is really good for, you know, I I, I kind of discovered that using Ekamara in a more traditional way is not all that great. Okay, so I use my weather just to um pull that Foggle out of the deck. Even though I probably could have waited, I'm actually not punished by it because he just insta clears it anyway. So it's not really uh, too big of a deal. And since he doesn't clear my, oh, I was going to say he, he doesn't go past my strength. He would have to play another card, but I don't think that's the case. So he has to dig for it a little bit. Oh, wait, what? I must be thinking of a, of a different game then. I played so many games yesterday, I can't even remember them, right? Probably just good for that. This is a great opportunity for me to use Ekimara, take out that Rotting Corpse, get my Ekimara on the field. Granted, using Ekimara in round three is really nice for uh, Neckers because you can get all three of those buffed up Neckers in a single round, which is astonishingly uh, high tempo. But I still have a uh, Vren Warrior. I still have some other cards in my deck that can proc that. And I still don't even have an Ecker in my hand right now, so I don't explicitly have to worry about it. The more carryover I can set up now, the better. Because that's actually kind of a big problem that I've had with this deck. Uh, or not particularly with this deck, but with my own play. Is that sometimes I'll hold my Ekamaras and Vren Warriors too long, and then I'll, or my carryover too long. And then round three comes around, and then I have all this... Uh, this carryover, even if it does have other synergies, I'm losing parts of its power because I didn't use it uh, quickly enough. Man, it's really devastating to get hit by, like, if they can pull, like, I had someone yesterday, he pulled out three emissaries, and then he pulled out a, um, uh, a toggle spy guy. So I got hit by four times by one of those, and then got hit by four times by another one. So that was, like, 16... Uh, 16 uh, strength that he gained there. It's pretty crazy if you can really get those combos off. And it's not like the movement archetype where uh, in Skotal, if you use a movement card, then you kind of get that two damage. Also, that two damage is random. 
This two damage is targeted and it's based on spies, which are a lot more common and a lot more controllable uh, and consistent than movement is. Hits me with a really good swipe, which is really unfortunate. What's funny is that he actually hits me with another swipe later. <laughs> For some reason, he has two swipes in his deck. I can't imagine that's a very good tech right now, right? Because most people are playing like uh, armor. I've only I've only gone in I've only gone up against two different ma uh, mirror matchups where I was playing against a uh, hyper consume lately. Anyway, so it's kind of weird to me. There's not really that many swarming archetypes unless this uh, this part of the ladder is particularly seeing a lot of. Uh, movements go at Tau. Then you can kind of clear those uh, three threes. I got really luck here, by the way. So uh, I was basically looking to get out of this round um, without... Because this three harpies, this three uh, strength harpy is useless and my five strength Igni is useless in round three or next to useless. I need to be able to mulligan both of them, but I can't mulligan both of them. I can only mulligan one of them, but I'm in round two where points don't matter. So as long as I can get one without going too low, if I can play one of those without going too low in tempo, then I can force another card out of him. Whereas, uh, which would make the, this very less valuable card uh, on par with one of his cards, which is always going to be better compared to what I have. But luckily he managed, he actually plays out his buff onto this guy, which I think was a mistake. He should have played on this guy. It's something you kind of have to watch out for, even if it's not still all that popular. He did see me play Marigold Tailstorm, and playing Marigold Tailstorm and Igni is relatively unusual. Um, and also, you can't expect a second Marigold Tailstorm in this deck. So I don't think it was that big of a misplay, but you still have to be very wary of Igni. And there was really no reason for him not to play the buff on this guy. <laughs> I'm just trying to get him to try and hit this. I'm not really sure why he hit that. He should have hit this, so I don't get that carry over into next round. So I go to that. Igni got some. Excuse me. Igni got some good. Uh, got some good value off. He uh, basically overplays into this round, which is nice. I can safely uh, get out of it. That was pretty much what I was looking for, for him to play a card like that. He should have played Harpy there. There was no reason for him not to. Well, I guess he was trying to go for the ma 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 most power he possibly could go, just in case he, he gets too rounded. I guess that makes sense. Seems a bit overkill, though. Yeah, I think you still could have gone for Harpy, then you would have at least some uh, <coughs> carryover going to the next round. I guess the reason he didn't go for the Ekimara, whoops, is because he only got one point here, whereas if he hit the the golem, he got two points there. And he was trying to kill the golem so I wouldn't get carryover. But I'm pretty sure this Ekimara resets to base strength, so he should have killed the Ekimara. Thankfully, I got a Necker. Really good. And dropping the Harpy is good because it allows uh, no other Harpies to come back in my hand. Okay, so this is, I guess this doesn't regress. Weird. I feel like at one point, I guess I'm mixing it up with the regressing from uh, over base strength as opposed to under base strength. So never mind. I guess what he did was fine. Weirdly enough, playing this card completely useless against me. I think he ate the Harpy too, which is nice. So I go ahead and play the Necker because, uh, oh, okay. So this is, this is basically where this becomes like my greatest game of all time. <laughs> so, uh, as I've said before, you want to save your flexible cards for later. Uh, both of my flexible cards here are my grave taker and my grave hag. Cause grave hag has three abilities, right? It has clear skies. It has fog. I think, or it has rain rather. And it has, uh, Arachnid Venom. I can't use Venom because there's only one target. I don't want to use Rain because it's only going to get one per turn. Uh, so I'm going to wait to use this. Now, Grave Taker. Grave Taker is like my, my wild card. It allows me to pick anything from his uh, graveyard and use it against him, right? Right now, I don't have anything in particular in mind to take out of his deck because he doesn't have a... I can't draw an Emissary, so I can't draw into something like a uh, Ran Warrior or a Nekimara. 
So I'm basically looking to just wait and see. Play it last. Let it have the biggest impact it could possibly have. And he has like the like the best plays you could ask for here. Oh, and it was really unfortunate because he played a uh, got rid of my entire Necker power. So even if I did have a way to consume it, it wouldn't have mattered anyway. So I go ahead and play out my Arachne Venom. Arrakis Venom. Things are looking pretty, pretty bleak, right? I have one Great Taker. He has two cards. He plays Siri, Fake Siri. If you don't know what this card is, Fake Siri is a card that you can play on either side of the board. If you play it on your own side of the board, it's just a nine-string silver. If you play it on your opponent's side of the board, it's a spying unit that boosts itself by one every single turn or every the start of uh, whoever uh, the start of your opponent's turn. And whenever your opponent passes, that Siri goes over to the other side of the board. Right. And this is a card you don't actually see a lot, so it can be a little bit strange to go up against. Now, as soon as I see this, uh, a light bulb goes off in my head because I remember. Playing, uh, I remember visiting the subreddit where they were talking about the interactions with fake Siri and how you can, um, and the interactions with the, the spy toggle dude. And in that, I called that information here as knowledge and remembered, oh yeah, I can totally counter the Siri if I can grave taker his, uh, spy toggle dude. And Unluckily for him, he had card advantage, but he still played fake Siri first. If he had not played fake Siri first, then I could have, uh, I would not have had an opportunity to toggle the spying on her. I go for it, infiltrator. I <laughs> played on fake Siri. It's spying, so now it's going to be gaining one per turn. <laughs> I think he was just like, wait, what? <laughs> And all the while, I wasn't actually sure this was going to work, so I just had my, like, hands over my mouth. I was like, oh my gosh, is this actually going to work? Am I just going to win this game because of this? <laughs> I'm pretty sure he doesn't actually know either, and he wants to see. Okay, so he was saving his assassinate for, uh, to get more damage off. It makes sense. Like... I can't even really blame him because the opportunity to do what I did is so unusual because the only card I think I can possibly do that with is Gravetaker. And Gravetaker isn't a very unanimous card in monster decks. So expecting that would be pretty difficult. I think his high his high EV play would be do, to do exactly what he did. But in this very particular instance in which I still had Gravetaker left, I was able to punish it. And look at this. It's 5 to 20, right? But because this goes up to 11, it's going to be a 22-point swing. Because it's going to go over to my side. <laughs> oh, man. Because it takes away 11 strength for him, and it gives me 10 strength. Oh, that's insane. Oh, my God. That was so crazy. I remember, like, my heart was beating like crazy. I, like, oh, it was, it was so good. Definitely one of my favorite games that I've ever played in Gwent. Uh, this is just like this is like the most exemplary example of utilizing knowledge to your uh, to your advantage. And also uh, as a secondary to that, saving your flexible card like caretaker for the very end. because You don't know what could happen. Things could change. And again, I don't blame this guy at all for that play. I think that was the high EV play. He waited to use uh, his assassinate for the highest value possible. Although it wasn't particularly necessary for him to go for the highest value possible. Anyway, I don't think it really matters. I think his his play was generally speaking a good a good EV play. I just happened to be able to punch him in these one one of these very rare instances. I think in a in a, a mirror matchup, you would say fake Siri to the end. Yeah. All right. So that's it. Thanks for watching. This was a great. This is it was, this was such a great game. I love it. <laughs>